So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Samir Mathur, and today uh, we are gathered here all to uh, conduct a short session on the personal data privacy uh, issue, which is being discussed very widely amongst almost all the users in the world today. And today we have two very very well known uh, speakers and subject matter experts on this subject. Uh, first uh, person on the <clears throat> session is Dr. Monica Ardia, who is the Dean and Professor at Rutgers School of Business, Camden, US. Uh, Monica, after graduating with BCom honors from Sriram College of Commerce in Delhi, she completed her MS in Computer Systems Management from Creighton University and PhD in MIS from Case Western Reserve University in the US. Monica conducts research related to design and use of systems including intelligence system as well as IT workforce trends and participation. Her research and teaching initiatives have received funding from 3M Foundation and Naval Surface Warfare Center. The perspective she will share around personal data privacy will be built on her research as well as experience in IT strategy and governance. Welcome, Monica. Thank you, Samir, and thanks for uh, inviting me to the panel and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker uh, with us today is uh, Mr. Jagdish Pelwal, who is a well-known figure in, uh, at least in India, in circles of IT strategy management. Jagdish is a seasoned CIO turned entrepreneur and angel investor. He is a global thought leader and expert at technology anchored business transformation. His leadership experience spans across multiple industries. He set up the automotive world's largest CRM at Tata Motors, making it a global benchmark in customer relationship practice. As the CIO for Tata Motors, he transformed Tata Motors IT and made it an industry-wide digital leader. His transformational work has been featured multiple times in Gartner EXP Research Global Leadership as CIO of APAC and AIMA region of GE Transportation. He spearheaded digitalization of GE's 2.6 billion US dollars joint venture with Indian Railways. Uh, Jagdish is also an active uh, investor through CIO Angel Network, have invested in nine startups so far. Jagdish has also addressed large gatherings at Gartner Symposium, has appeared on business TV and shared stage twice with AWS CEO as keynote speaker on cloud adoption. Jagdish has also won multiple awards like CIO, CIO Powerlift, CIO 100, CIO 50, Digital List and CSI National Award, Enterprise Architecture Award and Best Global Implementation Award. Jagdish is the founder of Jagdish Bailwal Advisory, helps business in achieving unprecedented growth through holistic technology intervention. So uh, thank you, Jagdish, and welcome to the panel. Hey, thanks, thanks, Samir, for inviting me here. Okay, so let, also let me introduce myself. My name is Samir Mathur, and I run a technology advisory company based out of New Delhi. It's called SM Consulting. And let's now start with the session. So for, my first question is to uh, Dr. Monica. So Dr. Monica, I wanted to ask you about uh, the challenges and your views on general views on personal data privacy and how implementation in the US, which where, where I assume the, uh, where I understand that the CCPA was passed a few years back, how has the, the experience of implementation uh, uh, been in your experience? Uh, thanks, Samir. So uh, maybe I'll start with a, a quick uh, context on um, why we are here today, why this topic is so timely. So, and then I can speak a little bit to the CCP, uh, CCPA and, and uh, what its uh, ramifications are. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, you know, the, the first point I wanted to make was the just the rapid advancement in technologies that have created urgency uh, around management of data uh, privacy. Uh, you know, these, if you, if you contextualize these advancements, they've largely been in three important domains, and each of them has a direct bearing on data privacy through collection, storage, and processing of data. So if you look, at, look back at um, uh, the last decade or so, data was largely connected through, collected through <clears throat> websites and applications. And today it's embedded in ubiquitous technologies, physical products, and uh, as a result, there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of data that companies collect today. So if you look at Walmart, for example, which is a classic case in um, uh, how much data they, they track, uh, Walmart collects about nearly 2.5 petabytes of data every hour 
from over a million customers. And imagine that they have over 145 million customers on which they're tracking data. So the scale of what we are dealing with has been dramatic. And at the same time, uh, when you look at um, the infrastructure, the infrastructure that's critical for the transference of this data in real, uh, real time, the ability to retain this vast volume of data possibly uh, today is because of the rapid advancement in cloud and storage infrastructure, the scale of which we did not have a few years ago. And then the last component on, on technological advancement is the uh, computing capabilities that we, that we have currently today that allow us to apply um, you know, complex machine algorithms to deliver pre uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics and target to cons consumers. So this confluence of technology and technological empowerment, while it has delivered important value to corporations, governments, and individuals, it's also increased the uh, vulnerability of our consumers. So it's, it's timely from that standpoint. Great. The other uh, two quick points that I wanted to make was, um, it, you know, on the consumer side, because we're trying to protect the consumer data, there exists a data privacy paradox, as, as you might be aware, that you know, customers, when you ask them how worried they are about data privacy, they often respond with very strong expressions of concern. But when it comes to putting their concerns to practice, for example, do they avoid companies that don't adhere to data privacy practices? Their actual behavior show a big contrast. That is, in order to receive convenience and services, we are very willing to give up uh, uh, our data privacy. So take, for example, my Fitbit right, that I'm wearing. Um, it's tracking my movements, transferring the data back to the company, what time I wake up, what time I go to bed, uh, you know, those sort of personal data that I know as an IT professional is going back to the company. But I'm very willing to let the company track that data because <clears throat> it's convenient. I can... Uh, track whether I walked my 10,000 steps today or not. So, uh, so that's another factor to consider. And, and the third point that I think uh, Jagdish will be able to speak well to is finding that right balance on delivering data privacy while sustaining business models. So for example, there's been some really, I'll speak on the academic side, um, very interesting work uh, by a group of authors led by uh, Vlahos. And uh, they have written about um, the fine balance that is needed between very tight data privacy practices and very loose data practices. And it's important for companies to find the right balance. So for example, imagine if Facebook and how it would lose its edge if it tightened its data privacy standards to only use limited consumer data or not to sell it to third parties or not to monetize it beyond the point. On the other hand, if a company is very loose with its data practices, there's a high vulnerability to, uh, to harm, um, running the risk of losing data. <clears throat> so there are some conflicting things that we need to think about. And um, I don't wanna hog all the attention, but uh, there is, you know, I'll speak to the California uh, laws a little bit more, these were passed in, uh, Jan 2020, but I do want to give Jagdish a little bit of time to uh, speak as well. So I'll circle back to that. Very good, very good, Monica. So Jagdish, the confluence of technology uh, adoption and 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 changes being uh, inherent changes that are coming there uh, is what what. Uh, uh, let's start with your your part where you uh, you like to have your views on this point, Jagdish. Yeah. So Samir, my my first brush with you know the uh, sensitive private data as it used to be called at that time you know was you know when uh, there was a specific uh, you know uh, inclusion of this in the IT act and uh, and then we started looking around that you know where are those risks uh, involved and you know we found like some very specific pockets like for example uh, you know our company used to run a hospital in Jamshedpur and uh, we found that as a big uh, area of risk because medical records are like you know a big uh, chunk of that private data. Uh, we, we found others, like, for example, HR used to be a pocket and all that. 
I think I think how it has evolved now is that you know these were still primarily systems of records, right? So these are you know certain databases where you could you know apply some let's say masking rules and you, know, you can apply some like you know rigorous controls and and allow you know only very limited access and all that. I think if we take it to the consumer world, if we take it to uh, you know the world of big data, you know Monica talked about <laughs> Facebook. You know the the game completely changes, and you know this being a conference on deep tech AI and all. Uh, you know there are various other nuances which come in, which I am not sure. You know whether the regulations are able to control or not, and maybe you know Dr. Monica can probably you know like throw some light on it uh, after I finish. Uh, so as I was doing a little bit of reading around it, I found that you know it's not only about the data that you are collecting about the consumers it's also about you know the metadata uh, of the consumers one and it's also about you know the inferences that you're drawing about the consumers which again you're storing in your database right and then you know what is machine learning machine learning is like you know like you're know, learning from data you know putting some inferences and that whole process continuously uh, goes on so how do you address that i'm i don't know frankly uh, that much but this is one area, you know, which really completely feels as a consumer. It feels me uh, makes me feel exposed, and as a as a leader, also it really you know poses a challenge to me, which uh, you know I would definitely be looking for some expertise in terms of you know how to address both in terms of like you know how does regulation you know address beyond the system of records, you know how does it address the other aspects, as well as like you know. Uh, I mean, uh, how how do we protect ourselves? Great, great, Jigdish. So, uh, so, so I think those are very valid points. I like the point that Monica raised about uh, privacy versus convenience. And whenever it is convenient as an individual user, whenever it is convenient, I want to have my privacy to the extreme. But whenever it, it is me only who goes around giving my mobile numbers and my mail IDs to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, that if if there is an offer coming, that please send me the offer. So it's a it's a matter of I might. I like to be video surveillance surveillance done on me at the airport because I feel it's it's safe. So because because it's part of the security, but I may not like that to happen in a mall. So it's a very 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 deep subject and it's a question of timing. Today I want to be very private. Tomorrow I'm going out in the with my family and I want to be in a different mood. So so it's a very tough subject for technology to handle. But coming back to the the point of uh, uh, what what Jagdish has raised about usage of uh, uh, privacy the understanding that privacy comes through protection and how will uh, dr monica this is i'm i'm uh, asking you this question that how will privacy be handled in a subject which the majority of the population uh, does not understand and and ai is something that all of us are using whether you are using an amazon or or any other tool facebook but we are not aware of the technology behind it how will privacy concerns be taken care of in that case monica yeah so uh, samir this is a interesting dilemma in the ai world in particular so as as jagdish rightly pointed out that if you look at anything that that is big data related you have so many machine learning algorithms that are running through and drawing inferences uh, from the data about individuals. And, and um, there's a lot of debate around, should there be um, uh, data privacy laws specifically that adhere to um, uh, artificial intelligence mechanisms? And the, and the, the, the most common response is, um, technologies will continue to change. You know, we had uh, broad artificial intelligence, then we had machine learning, now we have uh, deep uh, technologies. And so they'll continue to evolve, but there are some fundamental principles of data privacy that must be kept in mind irrespective of the nature of the technology. So interestingly, for example, uh, AI poses some unique challenges that we have not faced before. So, and the biggest one comes from how it makes these inferences as, as Jagdish was saying. So we've often referred to machine learning as a black box, right? Um, 
So there was an interesting, um, you might be aware of AlphaGo, uh, which is a um, you know, program that, um, uh, that plays the Chinese board game Go, which is a very complex Go board game. So in the beginning, when AlphaGo was created, it was created by showing it 30,000 uh, games in Go. And so it learned its techniques using those, those 30,000 games as, a case, uh, as cases. But then the new alpha version, which is AlphaGo Zero, the, uh, the technology just introduced the rules of the game and it allowed the, the, um, the program to self-learn the entire game. And in 40 days, it was able to learn the game on itself, just following the rules um, enough to beat the original version of AlphaGo. So this is something now, if you try to think about what was going on, how was it learning, it's a black box. And, and I think that that is one of the aspects where there is a lot of concern specifically around artificial intelligence and machine learning with data privacy, because we don't know how it's taking the cases and it's learning and adapting from it. But what we are seeing is that on the outside, when the learning has occurred, we are seeing some situations where it's uh, the AI technologies making decisions based on personal data about personal, um, you know, does somebody get a loan or not? Uh, should they be given a kidney transplant or not? Those are decisions that the AI technology is doing based on data that we fed into it. So it's the input of the data, the output of the decisions that, that are creating so much concern because the one movement that has been happening in the data privacy side is we want more transparency. We want more transparency at the company level. How are you capturing the data? What are you doing with it? But we also want transparency in the technologies that you're using to make these inferences. And AI doesn't lend itself to that sort of transparency. So coming back to your original question, you know, where, how do we make um, these laws and, you know, CCPA, uh, for example, the California Consumer Privacy Act and the GDPR are interesting examples, which are technology free, if you can say to some extent, I mean, CCPA uh, specifically speaks to digital data. Uh, but what it does say, for example, is uh, companies should let consumers know what data they collect and for what purpose. Um, they need to let consumers know who the data is being sold to, and the consumer should have the right to decline the sale of their personal data, to delete um, personal data, or to demand that they take their data uh, and transfer it to a third party if they wanted to. So these are technology independent uh, laws. And, and uh, I think that is where most of the debate centers is if we can make our laws robust in a way that they can be technology free, then whether it's AI, deep technology or something else that's brand new, we, we are still attempting to protect the consumer's uh, rights here. Great, great. So, so, uh, so, so the, even the Indian Supreme Court uh, has uh, agreed and has consented that the right to privacy is a fundamental right as to the constitution of India. That's one side of the game. The other side is that we were talking about uh, uh, what kind of instrument are we going to use for privacy protection. So one, one uh, instrument that is considered the best is taking a consent from the customer, right? Now consent taking is something that we all gave to all the apps without reading the terms and conditions there. Right, Jagdish. So my question, next question to you is that, okay. yes, consent is, is, I mean, you have given consent, I can do anything with the data. How do you make sure that, although consent I have given, but, but even the Indian PDB, which is still to be passed, says that the consent has to be explicit and the nature of the consent has to be divided, has to be, has to be defined. So if I am taking your consent for for X work processing for X, if I'm delivering your order, then I have to I have to make it sure that after delivery order, what I'm going to do with the personal data that I have carried for you, are you you have my home address, you have my number, bill ID, probably my financial details also because I have paid you. Then what happens after that? Is the consent long time consent or not? What is your take on this, Jagdish?
Um, so I was really laughing at you know the the the, the issue of consent. You know, we just say I agree and move on. Yes. And uh, what I do see that you know the good thing is that uh, GDPR is pre GDPR has preceded uh, you know the Indian privacy laws, and therefore a lot of organizations are getting ready. You know, and if you today. See, like for example, simple thing like cookies, right? You know, so you yeah. get an option to accept what kind of cookies. Okay, and I really like that. Actually, I tend to, <laughs> I tend to actually open that you know different types of cookies and only accept the essential ones. Um, it has made it really easy. The laws are making it easy for consumers to you know choose what uh, people do. Like for example. I've done quite a bit myself, you know, more both as an experiment as well as you know, like as somebody who wants to remain private. Um, I actually went to Google and uh, switched off part of their data collection, and it was so easy to basically, you know, one uh, look at what all data they're getting. That gets frightening because it took me about half an hour to you know do all those uh, you know turn all those switches on and off. Most of whom I switched off. But the good thing is that you know I had the option to switch them off, and there was there was a certain amount of explanation to you know why they collect their data and what they do with their data. So now I think the the issue is that I don't know how many people are aware of that ease that GDPR has brought in terms of your ability to choose. And there, what I'm encouraged is that, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, financial markets or whether it is, uh, you know, uh, digital payments and all of stuff, there are Indian regulators who are doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, communication and public awareness, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the do's and don'ts and, you know, how do you choose and stuff like that. So one of the things that I would really like to see is you know whenever the law comes uh, in india you know for people for uh, the government and regulatory bodies to spend some amount of money in making people aware that you know what you must do this is this is this is part of your uh, i would say choice right um now having said that uh, you know there was something we were discussing yesterday samir if you recall uh, that some of it can also you know there are some downsides to uh, to, to uh, you know, making it more and more complex, and that's that's the paradox that I see. Uh, that you know, the deep tech, the AI, and all of that, you know, they just make it so so much. I would say uh, they bring so much capabilities to capture data about you, and you know, and the metadata stuff. And if you are trying to control all of population, then you might just like you know make it so difficult for people to do business yeah. correct, correct. i want to bring in this uh, analogy i was reading about uh, this article which is about you know the disability uh, activism okay so here it is uh, uh, there was a law passed in us around uh, you know accessibility uh, uh, by all kinds of businesses whether small or big and these are like you know fairly I would say detailed stuff. You should have this for wheelchairs. You should have this for you know, let's say, uh, visually disabled people and stuff like that, right? And there are people you know who are basically uh, you know, along with the lawyers who are going and like you know, just like you know, taking services there, and uh, you know, silently coming out and then suing them, right? With the evidence of what what they don't have, and it's actually making things very difficult for a lot of small businesses to do business. So the issue that comes here is. That in the name that you know this kind of activism where uh, a small business, let's say a small startup, right? Uh, they are trying to make something work and they get sued. Okay, um, so there is a there is an element which is like completely I would say unaddressed out there, which is the ease of doing business. Okay, and where do you draw the boundaries in terms of the punitive nature of the regulation? Because Correct. I believe. Correct. The regulations are going to be very punitive. GDPR itself is punitive. I mean, uh, the IPDB is also going to be very uh, punitive. So where do you draw those lines where, you know, somebody doesn't just have to shut shop and, uh, you know, go broke? Yes, yes, it's very, very good point, Jagdish. Very good point. I was coming to that only that even in India and other countries also, <clears throat> the large enterprises, the large corporations, of course, have the 
resources and the manpower to be able to implement such a tough law from the point of view of understanding and actually implementing it uh, what about the the msme sector which is i mean 90% of the population in india so so i want to go back to jagdish and monica and and your views on the how the the mid mid size market companies are are looking at this and whether uh, this becomes a bottleneck in terms of growth too much of compliance on something which they basically don't understand too much what is going to happen on this and what is ha- already happening in us in developed economy like us monica yeah so samir I, I, you know there'll be there are two aspects that i'll address in this regard and and in the broader context of of uh, personal data so uh, one as you know as we were discussing yesterday one of the challenges as both the indian and the us economy are, are very enterprise driven um you know entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs and you know 60% of the us economy is run by small businesses um those companies don't have the capability of gathering collecting processing personal data to target themselves to customers in ways that the large tech even the mid sized to large tech companies do there's one aspect um in addition to what jagdish raised that um that is the on personal data for targeted marketing and so on are we then losing the um um the ability to um uh, innovate uh, at the corporate small company level because they are disadvantaged because of the infrastructure that is not available to them that is available to larger companies uh on the second hand i absolutely agree with jagdish that that i think um you know large corporations are able to afford uh data privacy managers and an entire uh, governance infrastructure that a mid sized to small company may not be able to afford or sustain and so how do these privacy laws uh, recognize those differences because as of now a lot of these privacy laws are flat in their structure that is they apply to each and every or co- corporation small medium or large and and so i think these are um uh, important considerations that will be will need to be factored particularly as india is moving actively towards a formal data privacy laws in the us it's actually still pretty scattered it's uh, ra- largely ccpa uh, which is a primary law it is you know it's mainly for california residents although most companies recognize they have to apply it to others but we have to there are federal level laws but there are also state level laws and so you've got 50 plus different versions of what data privacy means which makes it very complex for small medium and large businesses to navigate so i don't know that i have an answer similar to jagdish but i think um uh, it's going to be important to consider the infrastructural uh needs for implementation of these laws in light of the fact that we don't want to quash entrepreneurial activity within our economies jagdish yeah i mean uh, I, w- <laughs> i would just pick up that one point from uh, dr monica's uh, uh, you know uh, the thing that uh, uh, the laws are flat you know, they apply they apply uh, commonly to everyone <laughs> and the flat nature of these laws just makes it more affordable you know for the bigger guys to become compliant and and you know for the small guys to like you know be at risk i think somewhere i mean i have another dimension to it which is that you know we were talking about you know the 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 deeper and deeper nature of what data you collect and you know and then making sense out of it you know the, the two things that i mentioned the metadata and the inference data right i mean these abilities for the larger companies uh, you know uh, become much much easier to do that so they may still you know uh, they may still be compliant from the point of view of let's say you know the the system of records as i was talking about right and you know being compliant there but you know being more nuanced in their you know uh, in their in their approaches when it comes to the other aspects of it right you know and and this is where i think uh, 
you know the startups and the and the small and mid players uh, may again be at a disadvantage but you know uh, the good thing about the modern economy is that uh, you know anything that you can think of as a problem okay there is a startup which gets funded there is enough vc money out there and i'm sure you know people out there in the conference who are looking at it somebody is getting that spark of an idea hey you know why don't i create some sort of a you know x as a service you know where i can help uh, you know the smaller startups and you know the small and medium businesses become more compliant you know give them uh, give them the right tools here just just a, just a thought uh, yeah. no, no, you are right on this so 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 in conclusion yes i agree with you that this is a topic which has which needs a lot more discussion and the i think the the ball is in the court of the larger corporation and technology companies but ultimately it's the user the individual who's getting affected and the solution has to be uh, the best of breed i mean there has to be a balance between security which is a very very important issue and privacy which is the equally important issue and and this this balance also keeps on changing as per one's convenience so so this is a very uh, very soft line very thin line one is crossing and uh, both side of the venues have to be taken care of so so thanks uh, dr monica thanks jagdish for for joining us today and we also like to thank cyber media for uh, for giving us the opportunity to give our views here thank you very much